morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to also invite my two panelists here on stage. Please, Ren Yong and uh, Ren Hua. Good morning, everyone. It's pretty cool to be here in a physical event. Um, and so pleased to welcome my two panelists and be able to take off my mask as well. Um, Ren Hua here. Uh, is CEO of Taiwa uh, Company, which is a leading starch and consumer foods company in Southeast Asia. And he was previously uh, awarded the Outstanding Leader in Asia at the 4th Asia Corporate uh, Sustainability and Excellence Awards in 2017, and also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader in 2018. Um, Taiwa Company is actually a third generation uh, company and very much uh, closely linked to the topic of sustainability, uh, which I think has been a, a great part of their history. To my right is Ren Yong. She carries one title, but she's a multi hyphenate. She's SVP brand at Banyan Tree Group, but she is actually also a next generation entrepreneur and impact investor and a writer. And she has co-founded two pioneering mission-driven businesses in the co-working and e-commerce space, as well as the Singapore chapter of Asia's largest volunteer-run creative network, Creative Mornings. Now, I think Banyan Tree needs no introduction. It's a second-generation company. And before we jump right into uh, things, I'm not sure if you have Notice the similarity in their last names and also uh, their names, Renhua and Renyong. They're siblings. We are. A bet, <laughs> better looking one is there. And, and we, have a, we have a younger brother who's, uh, who's actually <laughs> yes. in the UK. Who's a third sibling as well. So today, I think we're here under She Loves Tech. We've just heard about the partnership between Microsoft and She Loves Tech. But we're going to take a different spin today. We'll start off with gender diversity first. And I'm going to ask you not about sibling rivalry, but uh, I have the opportunity to look at your sustainability report uh, 2020, in which you publish uh, the proportion of men and women by age, by rank, and by leadership uh, um, level. So I'm very interested to hear how does this gender diversity play into how you run your company? And is there a gender divide between the way the two of you run your businesses? First of all, it's so nice to be like with all of you in a physical real space. It feels a bit odd, but it's so good to have this energy in the room. So happy to be seeing all of you and not through a screen, even though, and hello to our virtual audience. Um, Gender divide. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, the only daughter. I have two brothers. I think in terms of the way we run our businesses, in hospitality, it's generally um, traditionally more of a male-driven business, but we have 50% of female leaders and supervisors um, across all management. But as we get to the top, it does get more imbalanced. Um, and that's something that we are actively changing. But the interesting thing is that um, when I see my brother and how he leads his business, it's the other way around in the sense that at the top of his management, it's actually majority female. And we trade quite a lot of insights uh, as to what actually is the difference between when you have that balance in the room, how decisions are made, and what conversations happen. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And a big thank you and big congratulations to the team and She Loves Tech um, for putting this off, you know, just kind of getting to our first uh, physical forum. Um, I think at a more deeper and personal level, I take a lot of inspiration and learning from my sister of what exemplary female leadership look and feels like. So, you know, over the course of many years, even from growing up young, you know, with our parents who were co-founders of the business, to over the last, you know, five, ten years in thinking about what exemplary female leadership looks like, my sister inspires me in many ways, right? If the nuances and thinking deeper about, okay, what does it mean to listen what does empathy look and feel like? What does a balanced voice in a boardroom look and feel like? So to me, it's much more contextual 
and much more, in some ways, emotional about the context of exemplary female leadership. Um, in Taiwan, you know, since I joined about five years ago, we've, we've made uh, intentional efforts to um, have very strong female role models. Um, so my, my CFO is female, my head of R&D is female, um, head of strategy is female. So we've had, you know, I think a, a culture of developing strong female role models, which I think in any organization, be it a startup, a government organization, can help to cascade change. At a personal level, I think, you know, Renyu and I, because we grew up close together, and although we work in distinct organizations on a day-to-day -day basis, I do take a lot of inspiration and, and learning of what exemplary female leadership looks and feels like. And that inspires me to then help to catalyze in my own way, which in Taiwan is around role models and role model leadership. And just adding on to that, I think one of the key aspects when we grow female leadership internally is community building. So, you know, we have um, 50 properties across 26 countries and maybe 12 nationalities. And like yesterday, for example, I was in a virtual room with 25 of our top female leaders. And they talked about feeling um, sometimes somewhat isolated, but creating that community within and partnership uh, modeling is what grows more female leaders. And I think that note of, um, can translate into how the organization behaves as well which I also you know, love seeing in, in the innovation networks that Renhua has done. And I think that kind of um, you know, SDG 17 uh, is partnerships. That's the kind of um, transformative framework for which we can um, catalyze change in a business. Oh, thank you very much. That was uh, fascinating to see how you bring it into the business. Uh, now I'm going to sort of um, seg into uh, a topic which I think is very close to your hearts. Um, and I think your parents were the original pioneers uh, in sustainable development in the hospitality industry. And I believe uh, you just celebrated 25th year uh, of your first, uh, you know, set up of your first uh, Banyan Tree Resort. So in UBS, um, and I'm the head for Southeast Asia and Singapore for the uh, Sustainable Finance Office, we have actually, uh, through our surveys of our investors and our clients, also heard that um, this topic today has become something very important, very close to their hearts uh, post-COVID. And interestingly, more women care about sustainable investing than men. So I'm going to not talk about the gender topic uh, again, but I'm going to switch to sustainability and would like to hear from you, how has that uh, impacted um, you know, the future of your strategies? And with COP26 and the events of that still um, you know, fresh in our minds, do you see that as a, a strategy that you will continue? And how are you evolving uh, that strategy going forward? Um, our history is in uh, regeneration and transformation. So the first property was actually on a tin mine. And if you ask my parents, they did not have a plan for sustainability from the beginning. It just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, and I think that's the same values that were embedded in us, which is why both of our companies share that and show that. In terms of the approach, I think the approach stays the same. There's two distinct factors to that. One is an ecosystem approach, meaning it's not environment, it's not people, it's a combined um, view of an ecosystem. And that's because when we enter a location, it's for a long term. It is a multi-generational view. So understanding interdependencies between the environment at play, local livelihoods and community, that ecosystem view and multi-stakeholder view continues. I think the urgency, though, of the decarbonization journey is real. And that's not something that we had previously monitored or been so closely um, uh, uh, feeling in terms of urgency. So, for example, we'd always um, done resource efficiency, saved uh, water, uh, created biodiversity counts on property, um, citizen science, but in terms of understanding real-time data on how we can create carbon credit models at the property level and how we can change our business model to be a service-based, from a service-based hospitality one to a nature-based one is our next leap. That's pretty cool because Singapore actually has started the first carbon uh, uh, climate impact exchange uh, with the Singapore Exchange and uh, 
there are many organizations now looking for nature-based uh, solutions uh, as the next uh, phase going forward. So I'm going to ask maybe Renhua now. We see a lot of disruption in the industry today, and many companies have either self-disrupted or actually uh, you know, been part of the innovation journey. So we think of Tesla that you know, has exceeded with its market cap the next five biggest rival car makers. Um, and I'm thinking of IKEA that is moving away from the traditional retailing of companies, uh, of uh, inexpensive furniture, which is quickly discarded, to now completely rethink their product design and create products that can be upcycled or refurbished. So in Singapore and, and with Southeast Asia being, and, and Asia and China being a big part of your business, I think these markets have all heeded this clarion call to speed up the transformation to a greener economy. So from your perspective in technology and in what you're doing, what are the unique commercial opportunities you see today in food, in technology, sustainability and, and wellness? You share with us some of your thoughts. I think for what we're trying to do at Taiwan is fundamentally build a very unique uh, agri-food uh, value chain ecosystem you know, across Asia Pacific. Um, so today the, co the company operates in uh, five countries with 15 operations, farm to shelf. We primarily focus on a couple of different plant-based ingredients, uh, mainly tapioca, mung bean, arrowroot. And really at every step of the value chain, you know, think about how we can you know, creatively adopt technology for a specific outcome. So for example, at the farm level, it would be much around you know, analytics, improving productivity, at the midstream level, it would be around processing technology, reducing waste, upcycling, and on the downstream level, it's around route to market. So for a lot of the, in our sector around agri-food, I think the theme of you know, technology enabling at different parts of the value chain and having different outcomes has been something very uh, powerful to us. Uh, and then drawing back, at, I guess, at a higher level, at a family level, you know, alluding to what uh, Ren Yong mentioned is, from the outset, I think we're very well suited because hospitality and tourism cannot just be well-placed for a world that's more sustainable, but can be catalyst for even more change for the world to be more sustainable. And being intentional about design is very important. In the binary world, it would be a lot more about how we design you know, future products and future properties. In Taiwan, it will be about how do we design you know, new platforms, starting something in bioplastics, we're moving into biotechnology. So the intent on design, about how do we design our platforms to be more uniquely sustainable, I think it's a... It's an incredible opportunity, an incredible window in the next decade or so. I also want to bring in the emotional part of change. My brother was the one who told me um, many years ago, all change is emotional. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, oh, okay. such a wise <laughs> quote. But at the moment, I think the, the sustainability uh, movement is very much grounded in the science of it, right? And which is definitely, and, and, and it's a huge part to play in that in the scientist role. But there's a bit of a divide, I feel, between the, the change that needs to be made and that science component. And in the hospitality realm, hospitality deals in emotions, it deals in experiences, it deals in people's behavior and lifestyle. We need all a fundamental change in lifestyle and an understanding of how we relate in order to change everything else that we do. So I think that, that aspect, um, on that design aspect, there's a design of the hardware, there's also the design of the software, the experience on a property. If you go and experience that, how would you, would, can you be inspired to change the way that you live your life when you go back home? That's the part that we are uh, wanting to unlock as well. That's pretty cool, um, because I've been obviously to your resorts, so you talk about the lift experience when you actually go there. Um, and I want to say that I took the opportunity to read their sustainability report. If you haven't actually uh, also taken a look, it's actually really inspiring because I think if it, for a business that started 25 years ago, uh, they have already been talking about uh, uh, impactful leadership. They've been talking about what matters to them. I think there were seven factors that you talked about. Um, I wrote them down here. Climate change, biodiversity, pollution and waste, uh, employee satisfaction, uh, leadership, ethical compliance, and data uh, privacy. And I think you talk about societal betterment uh, and transformation. So the third theme of what I wanted to talk about uh, also um, today was actually about the impact uh, that you have um, and the fact that you're driving this impact as a uh, family unit almost uh, and as a third-generation 
uh, company. So I guess the question here that perhaps we want to hear from you on is um, how do you actually see the next stage of what you're driving? So, for example, there are a lot of practices that I see, uh, say, for example, talking about Microsoft uh, here on stage, tying executive compensation to workforce diversity targets, um, polluters like Royal Dutch Shell or BHP, they are making changes by tying uh, executive incentives to carbon emissions. And I think the Harvard Business School is doing work to incorporate the measurement of uh, impact from ESG actions um, into traditional accounting measures. So how do you see this developing in Asia, given that you know, you've been leading the way, both in what is in your reports as a leadership statement, but also what you try to express to your guests, as you mentioned, um, so, what do you see as sort of like the next frontier uh, for this? Yeah, I think at the, at, the, at, at the longer term level, if you think about, you know, alignment or cascading down to UN SDG goals, you know, the 10 or 20 year, you know, road to net zero and, and all that, I think um, many companies now, obviously including ours, would have to operationalize, you know, certain milestone targets. So very specifically, you know, when you think about carbon footprint, scope one, scope two, scope three, you know, there's a lot of operational work to that. So I think the journey towards um, longer term goals, specifically around decarbonization, I think there's a lot more operational work that we really need to cascade down. So that's one big theme of just really just hitting those milestones on a three, five, seven year basis. Um, again, back to the theme of this conference from a technology perspective, what I think is very unique in this era is the combination of talent and technology and there's pretty much a generational shift. So, you know, the people that we hope to inspire and, and to attract and join at Bayantri and Taiwan for the next 10, 15 years would, you know, be younger, dynamic innovators who can understand the twin engines of purpose and profit. Uh, it will be, many of them may be freelance, you know, they may not be full-time, you know, executives. Some of them will be startups, uh, some of them will be ecosystem partners. So I think beyond the, the goals of, you know, whether it's the UN SDG cascade or you know, decarbonization, the generational shift and the generational dynamic that we hope to, I think we can play an important part in catalyzing the ecosystem, is really building these partnerships around next generation talent. Specifically, it, will be, you know, it might be peers our age, it may be startups, it may be obviously significant number of full-time exec executives, but also non-full-time executives. And around, a lot of that is around technology. Because the ability to scale with new you know, digital products, the ability to test and learn, whether it's in ag or food or hospitality, you know, it's at the all-time low of the cost of a pilot. Right? So that ability of you know, being able to test and learn, test and learn in you know, what we call 20th century businesses, whether it's hospitality or, or ag and food, is, is incredible. So um, that, that excites me the most in terms of how we think about you know, building business. And what excites me the most is really about the theme of next generation talent and ecosystems around our operating platforms. Um, I can speak to two things that I think will, will be coming. One is um, the change coming from a board level or advisory level. I think it does take some um, distance sometimes it, to apply parameters that an operating business needs to change towards. So whether that means um, you know, reporting, uh, whether that means compensation. Uh, you know, Climate Governance Singapore launched last week uh, as an initiative of the World Economic Forum. And I think that change will be a sea change in the next two to three years for which companies have to um, report with and comply with. That's coming from an external point of view. There is, There will be mounting pressure and any company that starts now will only um, benefit. In terms of technology, I think the, the underpin of that, we're seeing a whole host of companies and startups in the data realm of it, which I think will be also very interesting. Internally, um, building on that point of um, talent and tech, the next frontier, uh, at least in hospitality, is in startups that are working on creating that digital layer of hospitality and experience. And as a talent attraction tool, um, young people um, 
across all ranges and Gen Z or millennial, etc., want that purpose, right? They want to balance purpose and profit and their own life. And, and what is a digital hospitality, if I may ask? What does that mean? So digital hospitality would mean, like, so, for example, during COVID, Airbnb uh, pivoted to experiences. There's a tech startup in Singapore called Day Away, which, you know, does um, daily experiences catered to different audiences in hotels. So it's a... Do you go there physically? You still go there physically. And then for the last part, there's also digital hospitality where if you, you don't actually go there physically, where you actually go on a journey on your own, um, curated with experiences by someone else. So we're actually, I think that's the exciting part about the technology piece in hospitality. Hospitality is a very real estate uh, hardware model. When you have that software component of how someone can experience that, um, it changes the game. So, yeah. At the next uh, She Loves Tech conference, uh, I hope to be launching a product uh, around that. In, in partnership with Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> so we get, we get the global scale, you know, we can do. Okay, next year's bag and the mask will be Microsoft and uh, Microsoft and Biontree. Biontree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is so interesting um, and it's so cool to hear that, you know, you're constantly uh, sort of evolving this. Um, and I just want to ask one more question um, and hear from Renhua regarding the food side of things. Um, how comfortable are you? Um, well, maybe let me just sort of back up a little bit, right? Because the food industry also has seen a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, disruptive technologies. And um, when I was doing a bit of research, uh, I think sustainability was actually named as a disruptive trend because it's causing people to look at, you know, uh, the carbon footprint and the energy efficiency around uh, food, right? And, but Singapore recently logged a global first when we approved cultured meat. So it's lab-grown meat. Uh, for sale. So how comfortable do you feel about actually eating uh, and drinking? There's cowless milk today, there is this advent of 3D printed food, uh, there is cell-based uh, um, seafood. Actually all these things are happening in Singapore. Um, so share with us your view. Is that something that uh, Taiwan is also throwing its weight behind and how do you see that uh, whole food disruption uh, evolving for what we found out during our chat, um, your company is actually also uh, maybe a 21st century company because your gluten-free product uh, that you produce. So how do you see all these trends, uh, you know, colliding for the food industry? I think the, the at, at a very broad level, I think, you know, clearly the, um, you know, healthy for you, healthy for the planet trend is definitely coming. I think it's, it's, a, it's a tidal wave that will unfold over the next couple of decades. So, you know, plant-based products, um, you know, will continue to evolve over the next 10, 20 years. I think two things that will be most distinct and most interesting to watch is obviously the cost curve across all types of raw materials. So if you think about plant-based protein, they all come from a different raw material. It could be soy, it could be pea, it could be you know, cell-based, which is more, you know, uh, bioengineering. But essentially, I think when the cost curve comes down, you know, over the next five, ten years, I think the adoption rate will continue to increase. So I think we will definitely see a lot more mainstream commercialization. We're seeing that. And I think the cost curve will come down and companies like Taiwan, where are ultimately a midstream player and a producer, will be part of that trend to make it more commercially viable over the next 10 to 15 years. The other part of it, and which is very interesting, is really about the traceability and the origin of raw materials. Um, Again, you know, when you think about raw materials, ultimately they're plants. So in the West, you've got corn, soy, pea, um, corn, soy, pea, wheat, potato. In our part of the world, we have a lot of tapioca, we have a lot of mung bean, we've got rice, we've got sweet potato, we've got kutsu, we've got different beans, we've got even hemp. So the, the, the provenance, the, the uniqueness, the ability to create value out of Southeast Asia's raw material, you know, I think is, is amazing. Because from every raw material, you can get starch, fibers, proteins, and water. So we're trying to look at that, you know, and ultimately say, okay, with what we have in hand, from a Southeast Asia perspective, and these raw materials, you know, how do we create a lot more value in terms of, you know, raw material product? And then the final threat to that, again, going back to this raw material theme, is a ran back to kind of like a beautiful, kind of like circling back to uh, decarbonization. Because soil and planting is incredibly important and underappreciated in this part of the world. 
you think about nitrous oxide from the farms, you think about how farmers use like diesel tractors, you think about the source of the NPK fertilizer, that theme around the efficacy of soil, uh, improving soil, regenerative agriculture in Southeast Asia, I think it's, it's incredible. I mean, like, I just want to start a whole new business based on it. But again, I think, so, so in, to, to your point, I think the overall theme of plant-based is here to stay. Um, commercialization will come down over time with, with better cost economics. Um, raw materials from Southeast Asia, I think, have a fantastic opportunity to play in this entire world. And then back to provenance and thinking about our land and thinking about region agriculture is, is going to be increasingly very, very important. Yeah. I just want to pull one point there about how it's so interesting that even though, you know, if you look at it on paper, Taiwan is about starch, it's also about your relationship to the land, right? And for hospitality, also the same, right? We build on the land and it's about that, that shift in relationship and that regenerative angle that we're very passionate about. This is uh, so cool. Um, so I see here that I'm being told that we need to uh, wrap up, but um, maybe just tell us uh, if you had to, kind of going back to the theme of uh, She Loves Tech and hearing that Microsoft and uh, She Loves Tech is now you know, going to encourage women uh, startups and women founders. Um, how would you, what would your advice be for someone who wants to, to start a business today? Should they do food? Should they do technology? Should they do sustainability? Should they do hospitality? So what well, first of all, e email us because we want to work with the best founders and best startups in She Loves Tech. So, you know, horenyong at buyandtree.com and then horenhua at taiwan.com. So it's a, it's a plug because I think as, you know, long-term businesses, we want to, you know, learn and work with kind of like next generation talent. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even ask the question, but he already did his pitch so you can see <laughs> the, 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 this is a real competition here. But um, what would you say to... Uh, yeah, what will your elevator pitch be to a woman who's figuring out, <clears throat> should she join you? Should she join Ren Yong? Join, join both. Uh. Join, join both, both. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I don't think there's, there's definitely no competition here. I think, I mean, to your point on, on, you know, what to say to someone starting a business or a woman starting a business, um, what unites us is that businesses are here to create value, right? And what is value? It's not just wealth. Um, you know, there's that whole stream of how you measure um, intangible and tangible capital. And that's a body of work that's very exciting. But all entrepreneurs in their hearts just want to create value. They see something that should be better and then they create value and do that. And She Loves Tech provides that platform for it. A woman, when she uh, starts a business, reinvests that 40% more into her community. It's statistically shown, which is why microfinance lends to women. So I don't think that... Uh, so what I would say to someone, uh, a woman starting a business today, is just stay the course, know your why, and pull together the right community around you. That's it. Stay the course, know your why, and pull your community behind you. Renoir? So we, we've worked with, um, again, with, within Taiwan at an executive level, I think we have uh, um, a very strong inspirational bench of, of female leadership who are role models. And I think right now we're working with two kind of female-led companies in Thailand and, and, and Southeast Asia. Um, I think the, what I would say if I were to encounter a, a, a female founder or a, a female-led business is, and again, it may sound pretty uh, counterintuitive, is you know, just to listen and not dispense advice. Just listen and learn, right? I think a lot of times, particularly, I think there is, in many ways, a bit of a, and I'll say it openly, I think there's a, a bit of a male advice, and there's a, a bit of a male tendency to automatically dispense advice to a younger entrepreneur, or whether it's male or female, right? So I think whether it's male or female, I think what I would do is to, you know, really just to listen first and, you know, see how we can build and bring a lot of that, you know, ecosystem uh, partnerships uh, around it. I think there's a lot of incredible strength with, uh, again, back full threat to the earlier conversation around gender diverse teams. So you could have a female founder, it could have a male CTO, it could have a female founder and a male, it could be co-founders. So I think the ability of female-led businesses or female founders to build gender diverse teams uh, would be very powerful because that also has a catalytic effect. Right? Then they can you know, get more you know, females to come in. So that would be, I think, uh, uh, two parts of it, right? First is just listening to how we can support with our platforms, 
just truly listening and just trying to understand uh, without an urge to dispense advice. And then second of all, it would be encouraging them thinking about how do they work around gender diverse teams and, okay, you know, CTO, COO, a head of product, head of sales, and, and how do they think as a female-led founder, whether it's 10 people, 100 people, how do they think about their own vision around gender diverse teams? That's pretty cool. So I started off my question asking about how you you know, do this um, gender divide in your business, and you, I think we've come full circle. So listen well. So to the uh, women founders out there and uh, young startup founders in this age of uh, competition for talent, from Renhua, listen well. He will not presume to uh, dispense advice, but he will listen well to you. And then I think from Ren Yong, stay the course, know the why, and pull everyone in community around you. So I think we're looking forward to hearing from you further, maybe at next year's uh, She Loves Tech with a, with a new product. Um, and so pleased today to have had the time to uh, share and hear the insights from two third generation uh, business leaders uh, who are each running their own companies, but very much running this as a family unit. So thank you very much again, Renhua. Thank you. Renhua. Thank you, Val. Thanks a lot, Val. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.